during the break, please take a look. Make sure it's off, silent, or just turn it off completely. Once the contest has begun, the sergeant at arms will secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all the ballots have been collected. Please check again to see if your device is on off. We're going to go over the speaking orders. Once again, instead of having you jumping all over the place, I'm just going to give you the numbers. To start out with will be number four is Augustine Atagana. Then number one, Bridget Clark. Number five, Tracy Dinard. Number six, Kushan Gupta. Number two, Shandalan Hasty. Number three, Jim Lebeck. I will repeat the number one more time. Four, one, five, six, two, three. Got it? Mm -hmm. Got it. We will proceed with the international speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me when the green, with the green light when one minute is up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballot. Now, we will begin the speech contest. First contestant is Bridget Clark. Don't hold your pause. I will repeat the title twice and then the contestant name again. Bridget Clark. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype. Bridget Clark. everything. And do you know what this wall represents? It represents the media. The nightly news, the radio, the newspaper, but especially the internet. Who here was <coughs> googling and looking at headlines at any point today? Anybody look at headlines? All right. You know what we're going to do today? We're going to break, break, break through this wall. Now, why did I just break through that wall like Wonder Woman? Because, <laughs> because the media doesn't want to give you a 360 de degree view of what's going on, of what they're discussing. It's not nuanced. They just want an emotion from you, usually anger, outrage, fear. Fear is a big one. So, hmm, to explain this, I'm going to throw out the name of a neighborhood to you in Chicago. Now, if you're not familiar with this neighborhood, that's OK, because I'm sure you can think of a neighborhood nearby to you with these same characteristics. Are you ready? OK. When I throw out the name of this neighborhood, think of the first thing that comes to mind when you hear this neighborhood, what you've heard in the news. Are you? Humble Park. Gays. Drugs, violence. That's all they ever report about Humble Park. Gays, drugs, violence. And do you know what? I used to believe the hype. And here's the crazy part. I have never even been there. <laughs> now, let's go back several years. I used to live south of Wicker Park. I used to be an avid runner. And I would run to trendy Wicker 
park or down to the lake. And one day I got bored and I said, you know what, I'm going to run west. I didn't know what was west of me. I would never been there, but I was going to try it out. So I was going down the side street. I don't even know the name of the street. And all of a sudden, I get to the end of the side street, and boom, there is this gorgeous park. I was like, where am I? I, I had to figure it out. So I ran into the park. It got better. There was a lagoon with ducks and geese and this boathouse that looked like it had fallen out of Germany in 1800. And I started hunting around. Where am I? And I see this little placard that says, Humboldt Park Lagoon. What? You're kidding me. <laughs> this is the place that I've been so scared of because I believe the hype in the media. So fast forward a couple of years, I'm pregnant with my first baby, and my husband and I decide we gotta set down roots somewhere. So we <coughs> try, you know, the trendy old town near the lake, and the houses are great. And the price things are just horrible, so we move west, and we try, you know, hipster Wicker Park, uh, but the same problem, really nice houses, really expensive, you know where we're headed, right? <laughs> we're headed class to Humble Park. And if I had continued to believe the hype, I would have never been open to the idea of living in this neighborhood. And this neighborhood is so great. I just have to tell you about it. I want to break the stereotypes <coughs> of gangs, drugs, and violence that we always hear about in the news. Right across the street, family from Ukraine. A couple doors down from me, a Scottish couple immigrated from Scotland, love their accent. And then I have a neighbor also on my block whose mom's from South Africa, fell in love with a guy from Switzerland, <coughs> and then when my neighbor became an adult, she moved to the United States. It's a venerable United Nations on my board. <laughs> and you know what else? That's not the only great thing about Humboldt Park. It attracts artistic people. <laughs> Luckily, not the hipsters, but. <laughs> at the last kids party I was at in the summer, does anyone remember summer? <laughs> <laughs> it broke out into a jam session with all the little kids on musical instruments. And you know who was the lead singer? The lead singer of a local rock band because he's one of the dads. So my point is to go out and experience these neighborhoods you hear about because there's just so much more to it than what they want you to hear on the news. There's and make your own decisions. Don't just believe the hype. Now, you might be a little cynical like I am, and you're thinking, Bridget, that's well and good if they're reporting <coughs> on an area near my house, but what about what's going on in the Ukraine? It's not like I can afford to jump on a plane and fly to the Ukraine and investigate the civil unrest. <laughs> and frankly, if I could afford it, I wouldn't want to go there anyway because it was a war. So in that case, I would still suggest that you don't believe the hype and go in, read longer articles, read books. I read this great book on the Sudan. And then when it broke into two countries, I understood why. So if I can leave you with one last thought, don't. Don't believe the hype. <laughs>
Contestant number two, Jean Denon, Hasty. Who's in your circle? Who's in your circle? Jean Delon, Hasty.
And this time, I want you to think about can they create with you? Can they cooperate with you? Can they collaborate with you? Do they challenge you to change? Are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you get to the level L. Do they love you unconditionally? Do they love you to life? Do they lift you up? Do they help you learn? Do they help you get to the next level? Are you with me? <coughs> you just dropped about 10 people, right? <laughs> That's what the black dots are for. You start out with a big circle, a lot of people in your nucleus. A lot of people in your ear. But the magic E, hmm, do they encourage you? Do they excite you? Do they engage you? Do they enrich you? Do they evolve with you? Ladies and gentlemen, do they stand with you until it all ends? We're talking about infinite relationships. <coughs> relationships that will last forever. Those true relationships that last a lifetime. The wedding ring, what is it? The perfect circle. When you look up the definition of circle on the internet, it says that it is the perfect geometric shape. Ask.com, somebody want to look that up? <laughs> and it also says that a, a circle represents closure, but it also represents perfection and simplicity. When you walk away from this room today, you are empowered as Superman to change your circle. You can leave this place today and transform your life. All you have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is ask yourself who's in your circle. Contact me. Thank you. Contestant number three, Jim LeVac. Hangendale, Chicago. Hangendale, Chicago, Jim LeVac. Can you believe how cold it's been lately? I know we've had a couple warm days. The cold just keeps coming back. And I can almost guarantee it's going to snow again. <laughs> <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters and guests, it has been a brutal winter. And I know you're all just trying to put that as far out of your minds as you, ca as you possibly can. But you know what? I'm going to ask you to think back with me. Yeah, think way back to January when the polar vortex first hit. I never even heard of that term. I woke up one of those mornings, looked at the forecast. They said 17 degrees below zero. I've never been so cold. I ride my bike to work. I got there and I literally had icicles <laughs> pouring off of my eyelashes. And how about the snow? Did you know 
that this is now the third snowiest winter in Chicago history. We're about two inches off of number two. And by the time it's all said and done, I think it's possible this could end up being the snowiest winter in Chicago's all-time history. It was funny, after one of those really bad snowstorms in January, I was walking my dog. I have a Siberian Husky who happens to love this. <laughs> I took him on a walk through the loop. And I'm looking, you know, along the side of the road. What are these huge piles of snow? Wonder what's under there. There were cars under there. <laughs> I have no idea. You could not even tell. They had literally been plowed in from the street. And then you see those guys cleaning these sidewalks around here. They're plowing it right on top of the car. So you had these huge piles of snow. You couldn't even tell if there were cars under there. I can tell you this. If that was my car, man, would it have sucked to dig out of that mess. Gosh. You see, we all have our own horror stories from this winter. Some of them are really funny. Some of them, not so much. And if you're like me, you're probably wondering, why the heck do I live in Chicago? Why don't I move somewhere warm? Somewhere south? Maybe Miami, South Beach, maybe Texas, maybe Arizona. But I'm going to encourage you to rethink that plan. And hang in there, Chicago. This is a great city has a lot to offer. We have world-class museums, amazing architecture, public transportation, a gorgeous lakefront, great sports teams. I could go on and on, but it would take me all day to talk about how great Chicago is. So instead, I only have five to seven minutes. I'm going to tell you a personal story. I'm going to tell you about my perfect Saturday in July. And as I'm telling you about my story, I encourage you, think a little bit about what your perfect summer day in Chicago would look like. It might look a little bit different than mine, but as I'm telling you about mine, think about yours and try to put yourself there. See, mine is going to start on our balcony. We have a great place with a balcony on Clinton Street, not far from Union Station. It's right there on the second floor. I love having a cup of coffee and reading the paper as I sit out there. I like kind of looking below and seeing the passers-by. Some of them, normal. Some of them, not so much. And after I've had my breakfast and my coffee, I'm going to go out for a run. I love to run to the Chicago lakefront. How awesome is our lakefront? It takes me about two miles to get out there. How about that water? Lake Michigan in summer is turquoise blue. It's like being in the Caribbean. I've actually had relatives from out of town say that it looks like Cancun when they're sitting at Lake Michigan. It's really, really cool. And after I go on this run and get my workout in and take in the, the skyline and everything, I'm going to head back home, shower up. It's time for the afternoon. I think today we're going to go back to the lakefront, but we're going to relax on the beach. How about Chicago having about 15 different beaches? What other world-class city has such amazing beachfront, lakefront access? Just steps away. You can get there by the train. You can take a bus. You might be able to walk. You can ride your bike. There's so many different ways. And I bet wherever you live, it's not that hard for you to get to Chicago's beautiful lakefront and beaches. And after we've gone to the beach, we're going to head back home, relax a little bit. It's time to go out for dinner. Now we're getting to one of my favorite parts about Chicago, the restaurant scene. It's unbelievable. There's so many choices. And you know what my favorite type are? BYOB. <laughs> Get to bring my own booze and save a lot of money. <laughs> my favorite BYOB is Lucia's. It's this great restaurant on North Avenue, right off the Blue Line, right near the Kennedy Expressway. You get the experience of fine Italian dining at half the price tag because you get to bring your own wine that you bought from the store. It is a great experience. And if you haven't been to Lucia's, I encourage you after this meeting to Google it and set reservations to go there this weekend. It is that good. Now that dinner's over, I'm going to head back home, my wife and I. We're going to head back home, and we're going to end the day, wind it down, right where we started. We're going to grab a beer, maybe a glass of wine, and head back out to that balcony. 
and just have that one last nightcap and really take in what a great day it was. You see, this has been a brutal winter. It just keeps coming and coming. It just won't let up. But you know what? I'm going to ask you to picture one more thing. It's summer, and you are sitting outside at your favorite restaurant in Chicago, maybe on an outdoor patio, and you're drinking your favorite adult beverage, as long as you're over 21, <laughs> if not. And you know what? You're going to think back to this winter and just how brutal it was. And the fact that you made it through this terrible Chicago winter is going to make that drink taste just that much sweeter. Madam Toastmaster. May we have one minute of silence, please, Timekeeper? Contestant number four, Augustine Atagana. Follow the fun. Follow the fun. Augustine Atagana. Like, 
not what someone else designed for you. <laughs> Live a happy life, the one that you promised your little self, and make it an issue of a daily life. Every day, go to bed with a smile. <laughs> Today was fun. <laughs> While you are it, stay focused, because there will be some moments, some embarrassing moments, but then you have to stay focused. May I share one with you? Yes. yes. Last year, I took my young daughter, seven years old then, for a weekend at the water park with a few more of her friends. All I can tell you is that I came back with some dilated eyes. <laughs> <laughs> dilated with fun. The only difference between me and my little companion was just that. The size of us. <laughs> we tried everything. The water slide where it failed. As I was standing in line, waiting for my turn, I noticed that my little companion were having a little was too much fun. The ratio of rides was one for me against three. I was not going to let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> notice the adjective, little. Because that is what my authority brain forgot to consider when I decided to drop my inflatable to switch to the body slide. <laughs> Before I knew it, it was my turn. <laughs> I went, <laughs> <laughs> I was stuck in a tube. So <laughs> oh, no. I took a deep breath to call for help. My sense was suddenly back. Calling help meant having the whole pack attraction attention. <laughs> I checked my abuse bedding suit. And I thought, they will be concerned at first. But then, once they get me out, they will surely notice the disparity of size between the two and me. <laughs> and they will be asking, what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe they will not even be able to take me out. They will have to call the firemen. <laughs> and this could be the news. A flash on the headlines. A mommy riding a killing tube gets stuck in it. <laughs> <laughs> there were only one thing to do. I slowly scoop myself out of the tube. That was embarrassing, but that didn't stop me. I kept on having fun. That <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I'm bringing this invitation to you is actually to ask you to stop behaving your age at all times. Because when you be behave your age at all times, you take the focus away from things that matter the most. When you're happy, you want to spread the happiness. You become concentrated of all the happiness because when you're happy, you want the most of us to stay happy. The most important people, the children. And then you realize it's not okay to interrupt a childhood. It is not okay to stop somebody innocence. Children have to have fun. If you have happy children, we're going to have happy grown-ups. And the grown-ups around us are going to want to be happy, have everybody happy, and I promise you, you're going to have less of those ugly news you have nowadays. And on top of it, your beauty and health is going to be on your side. Say thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Today, now that you're the best, the best of yourself, now that you have the power to get things done, Honor that promise you made to your little self. Celebrate adulthood by being happy. Happy is easy. Happy is easy to share. Happy is the way to be. Happy is preserved. To be preserved. Tell them, tell them, tell them, please follow the phone as soon as tonight. Go to bed with a smile. Thank you yourself to be happy. Madam Comptes Master. <laughs>
Thank you. Contestant number five, Tracy Dinan. Paste and flour, the recipe for life. Paste and flour, the recipe for life. Tracy Dinan. Do you remember your very first art class when you used paste? Well, I don't know about you, but I remember mine. I was in kindergarten, and I couldn't paste for anything in the world. When I would paste, my fingers got all stuck, and paste went in my hair, and my hands, on my clothes, and even on the floor. It was terrible. I'm telling you, I just wasn't good at pasting. In fact, we would have to cut those Valentine cards. Remember Valentine's Day? <laughs> you had to cut those Valentine cards and paste them on construction paper. It was terrible. <laughs> My paste was in the middle of the construction paper and it was gooey. So whenever I would put my Valentine cards on the wall, you could see the goo. And here in the gallery, she couldn't stand me. She would tease me and she would say, There's Tracy's paper! Look at her! She doesn't know what she's doing! <laughs> Remember those kinds of kids? <laughs> it was horrible and it was devastating. And guess what? I would cry. I was nothing but paste and flour. <laughs> Speaking of flour, my grandmother, who used to call her Mama Hightower, she would bake delicious cakes. And Mama Hightower would ask me to be her helper very often. So I was her helper. Yes, I was. And I would help with the flour. And when I would put the flour in the pan, well, just like the paste, the flour went everywhere. It was in my hair, it was in my hands, it was on my clothes, and even on the floor. I just couldn't do anything right, seemingly. And Mama Hightower would say, Now, nah, baby, a good cook is a clean cook. <laughs> Put it on in there, crying and slobbering and spitting up and, and fix yourself, baby. Be a, a kind of a faith and power, not paste and flour. <laughs> I 
remember when Mama Hightower said, be a young girl of faith and power, not paste and flour. And I looked my boss right in the eye. I didn't say a word. I just took it. <laughs> I wanted to crumble, but I didn't. <laughs> very personal, and he ended up apologizing. Well, from that time to now, I found a recipe, a recipe for life. Would you like to know what that is? I'd like to share it with you. I found that if I took a cup of collaboration, it would teach me how to work well with people. And then I mixed it with another cup of critical thinking. That helped me to learn how to think quick on my feet and also learn how to read between the lines. I found out it's not always what people are saying, but what people are not saying. Then I mixed it with self-awareness. That helped me to manage my emotions. I also mixed it with another cup of assertiveness. That gave me the courage to learn how to network with people that I didn't even know. And then I mixed it with another cup of initiative. And you know what that did? That helped me to begin to take something from nothing and start something on my own without always having to lean on someone else to do things for me. <coughs> and then I mixed it also with two cups of thick skin because I knew not about if people are going to like me. People won't always like you. You will be corrected at times. And people sure enough will get angry. But when I mix that all together with that paste and flour as that adhesive, I put it in the oven and turned it up to 400 degrees because how many of you know that life will heat you up? <laughs> oh yes, I've been in the fire and still in it. But I don't crumble like overcooked cookies. I can look at life and I can say, I am a woman of faith and power. I will not let, not let life get to me. Don't let life get to you. I have learned it's not always about what you want. Sometimes things will get tough. Oh, yes, they will. And when they get tough, and when life has gotten tough on me, I will not be paste and flour, but faith and power. Do you have a recipe? Would you like to use mine? Madam Toastmaster. May we have a minute of silence, please, and keep it. Thank you. Our sixth contestant, Kusha Gupta, Naomi and Gary. Naomi and Gary, Kusha Gupta. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. Nelson Mandela. He was a giant of the civil rights movement. And last December, when the giant fell, the world shook. 
But, did you know that just a month before he died, an important civil rights milestone was reached right here in Illinois? I bet Nelson Mandela would have found that news a lot more interesting than the news of his own demise, because this milestone affected a group of people he cared deeply about. People that you and I care about. And just like <coughs> Nelson Mandela, someone paid a heavy price for it. Let me tell you what happened. A woman named Naomi was at her son's bedside for a week. Her son, named Garrett, was 46 years old and already in a nursing home. He had a rare illness called Hicks disease that was slowly destroying his brain. He didn't have much time left. In the middle of this dark situation, a call came in from Naomi's workplace. Something very important was happening at work, and they needed Naomi's help to get it done. And to get to work on time, she would have to leave Garrett's bedside now. What must have gone through Naomi's mind when she got this message? What could possibly be so important at work to tear someone away from her dying son? Couldn't somebody else handle this? It turns out that this woman, <clears throat> Naomi Jacobson, was a member of the Illinois House of Representatives. The House was about to vote on a bill that she had co-sponsored, a bill to legalize same-sex marriage in Illinois. This was a cause that Naomi fought long and hard for and strongly believed in. Her son believed in it too. But did this have to happen now? Now when her son needed her the most? <coughs> it must have been with great reluctance that she left Garrett, but she did. She drove 90 miles from the nursing home in the tomb to the Capitol in Springfield. When she got there, her colleagues were already debating Bill on the floor. She was there for two and a half hours, which was the time it took for the debate to end and for her vote to be cast. The bill passed with 61 votes in favor, just one more vote than necessary for it to pass. It was that close. As a result, Illinois is the 16th state in the nation to recognize same-sex unions. As soon as her vote was cast, Naomi drove the 90 miles back to the nursing home. But it was too late. Garrett had passed away. He had died just 10 minutes before Naomi got. I think it's an interesting coincidence that Illinois is both the 16th state in the Union to recognize same-sex marriage and the home of the 16th U.S. President, Abraham Lincoln. Did you know that early in his political career, Lincoln was not in favor of abolishing slavery? Oh, he hated slavery, but he didn't think it was a good idea to force the South to give it up. But over the years, his views evolved and ending slavery became the focus of his presidency. Similarly, our current president, Barack Obama, <coughs> has undergone an evolution in his thinking. Before running for the presidency, he spoke out against same-sex marriage. But <coughs> when the bill passed in Illinois, he spoke strongly in his favor on Twitter. Still, isn't it a sad irony what happened to Naomi and Garrett? This new law in Illinois guarantees a person the right to be at his or her spouse's bedside at the hospital. But Naomi had to leave her son's bedside in order to protect that right. And she never saw him again. But what can you and I do about that? We cannot take away a mother's grief. We cannot give her the extra 10 minutes she needed to get to the nursing home on time and hold her son's hand as he finally passed away. But there was something we can do. We're doing it right now. You see, 
This change in our nation's attitude towards same-sex marriage didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen as the result of one person's actions. It was a gradual evolution. Millions of people taking small steps forward. So tell the story, spread the word, and help others take those small steps forward too. And that way, you'll be supporting everybody who stands up for equality and justice. From the giants like Nelson Mandela to the little ones like Naomi and Garrett. Madam Toastmaster. remain silent for the judge to complete their ballot. And the ballots have been collected by the vote counters. Madam Postmaster, all of the ballots have been collected.
let's see how are you lining up here. Let's just get a little nicer chorus line, a little bit closer. Okay. So quickly, please just tell us what group up. What club are you representing? Just kind of quickly go down the line. I'm representing knowledge speakers, but I'm also part of Next Step as well. Ah, uh, well, I'm representing the Nokia Chicago Toastmasters Club. Morning Star Speakeasy. EPA Toastmasters. Articulators of the Windy City. <laughs> 209 Toastmasters. <laughs> Articulators of the Windy City. I represent the Presidential Distinguished Club. Toastmaster 5990. <laughs> Chicago Speakeasy. Okay. <laughs> so quickly, that's to get to know their personality a little bit, their background, some curiosity. But I think they probably should have you time. One minute? Oh, wow. <laughs> or two? What do you think? One minute. One minute is a quick hit here. Jim, you say you are interested in endurance sports. Is the Chicago weather an endurance sport? sport? Uh, somewhat. It's. It, I would say it is an endurance sport when you have to take about 15 minutes before you go for a run just to put it on enough clothes to stay warm. And then when you get back and you have to take a 45 minute shower just to warm back up because it's been so cold. It actually happened to me, I believe, yesterday. So yes, it's definitely an endurance sport. Thank you. And Kate, outer space. You are out there. <laughs> well, I've never actually been to outer space before. Oh. Okay, that be true. But I did get to meet Buzz Aldrin, which was so cool. I've never shaken so hard in my life. I was so excited. Uh, I got his autograph. I got to take a picture with him. It was the coolest thing ever. And my whole wedding was outer space themed. We had outer gave away space ice cream as the favors. We had stars all over the ceiling. It was awesome. I am a, I hate Star Wars. I hate Star Trek. As a software engineer, I stick out like a sore thumb, but I love outer space. That's my nerd dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice outer space. From the outer space, travel to travel on Earth. <laughs> on Earth, uh, I guess that's why we're all here. Uh, but, um, but I, travel was one of my interests, but I would definitely have to connect with the Chicago weather in, in that it is an endurance sport. I actually broke one of my shovels and wow. shoveling ice. And it, you know, so anyways, I, I connect with that. But yeah, travel is, is, is one of my interests as well. But uh, yeah, Chicago weather. <laughs> okay, great. And Liddy, you say karaoke. Can you sing about the weather, the sports? <laughs> what do you sing about? Happy <laughs> <the> sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Kamikaze karaoke too, where you just go up there and they give you a song. I'm not that good at it. But it's <laughs> 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 Sounds like those master, you can practice, practice, you get better at it. <laughs> and Cherie, you said you are into community service, very noble. You say nothing stops you but you. That's right. Tell us more. <laughs> well, nothing can stop me but me because. Each of us have the power within ourselves to do whatever we set our minds to do. And we hold ourselves back by not pushing ourselves or by not believing in ourselves. I believe in myself, so I think if I'm not going to accomplish something, it's only because of me.
put it all. <laughs> Shandalan. And you say, one of your interests is television. <laughs> and you're talking about circles. How do they connect? <laughs> <laughs> they don't, but I am a scandal fanatic. <laughs> Engineers have to have good public speaking and communication skills too, but because now and then we do have to talk with clients, <laughs> our bosses, the people that are affected by the projects that we design. So our work isn't all just math and science. If we cannot convince people and communicate with them and understand their concerns, then our work as engineers will really be worthless. Thank you. Very wise global vision. Woo! Woo! Participation certificate. Appreciations. So just stay right where you are. When I hand it to you, you can just hold it like this and then let the folks get out your camera, get out your cell phone, get some good shots and start tweaking it. <laughs>
Okay, John, uh, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Kodak moment. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even look. <laughs> <laughs> 
Everyone who competed with that, our contest is adjourned. Have a good night, everyone.